Welcome to Dyscastia, a podcast for parents and teachers about the best way to support kids living with learning difficulties. I'm Michael Shanahan. And I'm Bill Hansberry. And today we're talking about teacher education, specifically university-based teacher education. But before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we're casting to you today from the traditional lands of the Ghana people. Bill. Michael. Would you like to introduce our guests? I would. Uh, on my right, I have Robert, and straight across from uh, myself, we have Lara. Uh, welcome, Robert and Lara. Thanks so much for joining us on Discast here. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. Okay, Robert, so what's your story? How come you're here? So, I have begun and are currently concluding a education degree. Um, I'm in my fourth year. I'm yet to complete my placement, but I'm currently working at a school as an ESO and just in an OSH program. Lara, what's your background? Uh, we don't have uh, enough time to talk about my background because I'm in my <laughs> mid-40s, but um, I started my education degree back in the 90s, uh, became a police officer, taught um, English as a second language to adults and then decided to go back and complete my degree. So I'm actually in my second year of teaching and doing first year subjects as well. And I'm at uh, Flinders University doing that. And um, I'm actually quite um, excited to be doing Bill Hansbury's course at the moment. So that's how I came into contact with Bill Hansbury. Yeah, so this is another episode that's cropped up as a result of Bill's training course that he does. Uh, specifically to teach people how to teach kids living with dyslexia. And we thought we'd take advantage of the situation, knowing that you two were here and you were in teacher education currently. And it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment, isn't oh, it, Bill? It is. We we slapped our hands together and licked our lips because um, having a couple of pre-service teachers here, um, yes, it, it is a hot topic. And now I just want to give a shout out to uh, Greg Ashman because just this morning in my feed I see a, 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 a short blog by Greg Ashman called Criticism of Teacher Education is Not Criticism of Teachers. Uh, and Greg, I think Greg must have known that this was, you know, on the cards because obviously Greg knows about Discastia because we're just so we're so <laughs> darn God. famous, aren't we, Michael? <laughs> but um, it was just a, as if the the planets had aligned. Um, so thank you so much for uh, agreeing, guys. Yeah, again for being here. So, look, what we don't want to do, Michael, and you've very rightly kind of said we, we don't want this to end up being um, a bash of education and it's uh, of education uh, training facilities or teacher training institutions because look we're all sick of people bashing each other we're we're right in the tail end of a you know of an election campaign for the love of Pete um, but this also isn't criticism of teachers but th I think there are some questions to ask uh, and it's not just me about how well prepared are pre-service teachers be, uh, being to teach uh, reading and spelling and writing? And we thought, who better uh, than to get a couple of people here who have, yes, done TSD Level 1 and seen this kind of structured, multi-sensory structured literacy approach on steroids because we've been talking about how, how we do it with kids with with uh, difficulties like or uh, disorders of reading like dyslexia. So, yeah, we're just really interested to pick your brain, guys. So, Robert, you're at Uni of SA at the moment, yes. aren't you? Yes. And, Lara, you're at Flinders. Correct. So, yep. we're really blessed also to have uh, – we're not going to compare and set these off against each other. We just want to hear the experiences of these guys in their, in their teacher training. Yeah, that's right. Because I think whenever you have a discussion – about dyslexia and teaching and literacy, it kind of always descends down to blaming universities and blaming teacher education. You know, it's a very common thread. So as people who are currently in universities learning to be teachers, do you think it's fair criticism? Well, yes and no. I mean, our profession is something that we have to consider is an ongoing changing thing, right? So I say that from the perspective of our knowledge from yesterday isn't always going to be the same years to come right so talking about dyslexia and, and and what my knowledge is of it from a university point of view i stumbled across the word when i was in school didn't know much about it at university level it was maybe brought into the conversation in one particular um course subject and it wasn't literacy right so already i'm thinking well how can the university or that that um, program change to make it a more um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? To, to make it known, right? Mm. For, for the topic of conversation, how could you bring uh, dyslexia into the, into the topic earlier? And, and that just means we're refining our skills, right? It doesn't mean that the teaching is bad or the content is bad or anything like that. I've had great teachers in the past, some of them not so good. They've all had their character traits that needed to be refined and developed. And our career path is to constantly change mm. with the new knowledge that we're getting, yeah. right? So this new knowledge with, with Bill's course that we've just completed today, I've, I'm already thinking, well, my approach has to change when I'm working with kids who have dyslexia mm. because of my new knowledge, right? Yeah. So it's, I'm just trying to touch on that, to on that idea of we are going to constantly have to change and grow to move with the times to cater for what is in front of us. Mm. Okay. Um, so, Robert, you, we're talking about dyslexia and needing to understand that stuff. Um, there's a, there, there is a broader picture here, and we've talked a lot over the last few days about how we teach kids to read and spell generally because yep. we've talked a lot about wave one, two, and three. Um, so I'm just going to put it out there. How well equipped do you feel? What year are you at uni now? So fourth year. How well equipped do you feel to get out there and sta confidently stand in front of a group of potentially littleies, reception year ones, year twos, and to teach them the complexities of the English orthography? I'd feel pretty confident. Now, I, I was chatting with Sally, uh, Sally earlier today and I was telling her about how I was applying a few of the principles that we've learned in this course to dealing with this kid who hasn't yet been diagnosed with with dyslexia mm. right and and putting to practice some of those new tools that that i've been given to use mm. and already i've i enjoyed that process with him and funnily enough he enjoyed it so yeah no like you said it's one of those things that now that we are more aware people are more aware it, it's a matter of applying that knowledge and and, and trying to reach as many people as possible because that's how we're going to create that change. And it's worth you telling us when you said you work with a student, in what context are you working with students at the moment? So outside the classroom and inside the classroom. Yeah. Um, this uh, instance was one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. So um, on this particular day, grab that student outside the class and we worked together for an hour um, and it was a literacy-based like task. Yes. Um, Having not completed that successfully, I thought, let's try something different. And I pulled out a set of the wooden uh, A to Z alphabet. Yeah. And, uh, and I asked him to arrange those for me and, and I timed him. And I was amazed to see that it was a 10-minute time limit that, you know, in that time he, he completed the, the yep. rainbow yep. for me. And there were a few letters incorrect and, and we had a discussion about it. And then we started talking about, um, some of the vowel letters and we looked at just A and I. Yeah. And why are they vowels? What are vowels? What sounds do they make? And I was harping on those things for the hour. Well, yeah. Saw him at the end of the day as he was exiting the gate and I asked him, what do we learn about today? And he said, A and I. And, and there's some of our vowels. And I went, that's brilliant, mate. Yeah. Like th the small win. And you work as an ESO. We won't mention the school because yep. we haven't got permission. But you work as an ESO in this school yes. uh, as part of their in their intervention for students struggling with literacy. So now that I've completed the course, that is something that I'm going to be taking on. Very yes. good, wonderful. So that knowledge you've got, uh, Robert, about. So you've talked to this student about the alphabet. The students put the alphabet out. You've talked about vowels. Where'd you pick that stuff up? Well, the course. Yeah. Uh, t yeah. Here, because we've done this over three yes. Fridays. So I yes. gotcha. Yeah. Yes. How much of that stuff uh, did you get at uni? Not a lot. Right. Mm. Okay. Not a lot. Yeah. If, is this part of your uni that you've come here to do this, or is this no. like off your own bat? No, off off the bat. Yeah. I mean, and, and and it is interesting because having thought about my experience for literacy teaching at a university level, the one thing that that stood out was um, EALD. Right and, and how to cater for that. Now, obviously, Australia is a very multicultural country and, and we do have a lot of kids that come into our school systems that are EALD. Is English is a second language, yep, yeah. Yep. Yep. And, but why isn't dyslexia spoken about? Mm. Because what if the kid is EALD and dyslexic? Mm. Yeah. Well, now there's two things. Excellent question. Excellent question. And now, I'm just conscious that Lara's, <laughs> Lara's here and it would be really interesting to get your perspective is this something you've come across? So you're here as well. Is this under your own steam or is this part of your course that you've come here to do this training? No, this is under my own steam. Yep. My partner actually um, asked me to do this. He offered for me to do this. His son is actually dyslexic. And um, I 
hadn't heard of Bill before, he introduced me to this and um, I came along and thought that it was going to be something that I hadn't heard of before. But actually, we are learning these exact same principles at uni. Oh, okay. The right. exact right. same yeah. things. And yeah. what Bill's managed to do is teach it a little differently, a bit more dynamically. Sorry, Flinders. <laughs> but just a little bit differently. And what the good thing has been is that um, although I'm learning the exact same things, it's just cementing what I've already learned Um, And what we're doing at uni, though, is instead of teaching it in a way of this is how we teach dyslexic children, what we're doing at uni is this is how we should be teaching every child, Mm -hmm. teaching phonemic awareness, teaching phonological awareness, teaching with decodable readers and teaching a balanced principle to um, assist every child in the same way with authentic text as well as well as decodable readers, to give them a balanced approach so that every child has every right to read so that they're getting everything they need instead of the old ways, like the whole language ways, Mm. which is what I was unfortunately given years ago. Me too. And um, I was actually given different ways as I got older. I had a year five and six teacher, Mr. Wright, in case you're listening. Um, He was brilliant. He taught phonics. My mum was a teacher for nearly 50 years. She taught phonics and I picked up that that sort of um, thing along the way. And I became um, a CELTA and DELTA teacher in Switzerland through Cambridge University. Sorry, Cambridge University. What's and, that? Um, What's CELTA and DELTA? Oh, it's English as a second language. All right, yep. So I taught a range of different people, people who'd never spoke English before through to um, advanced learners. And I taught people with dyslexia and I taught them decoding without even realising I was teaching them decoding. And it's all sort of coming back to me. I was teaching graphemes and, and phonemes and, and morphology and orthographic mapping. I taught myself through finding it on the internet and all the things that I'm learning with Bill and through uni, um, I taught myself. And so it's all just being cemented now in a different way. And when you learn the same things through different tutors and different teachers, yeah. it just sticks in your brain. Mm. So you learn through the lecturer at uni, you then learn through your tutor, you then learn through someone like Bill, then you learn through someone like Sally, then someone like Karen, and somehow your brain just goes ding, 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 and it just sticks. So you taught people who English is not their first language, Mm -hmm. and the way you taught these folks was to pull our system right apart, Yep. teach it very explicitly. Yes. Why on earth hasn't it been... Uh, part of the common practice in Australia to do that with uh, early literacy students. Why? How is it? That I don't know, but I do know that it takes a lot of work. Yeah. And I, I wonder whether perhaps because it takes a lot of work, people just don't do it. Mm. It does take a lot of homework on the teacher's part. It took me hours to construct these worksheets. Mm. And maybe people just don't have the time or they don't know what they're doing. I don't know. I just made it up. Mm. Or maybe and, they get a program given to them. Mm. And mm. just use it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. because how what how else do you how else do you know what to do if someone gives you a program and says here's how we teach? Mm. As a new teacher, you That's know, right. you'd be pretty hard to question that and say, Oh no, I'm gonna do it this way. You probably wouldn't have a choice. Because I know better. <laughs> yeah. 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 I had a really good um lecturer through Cambridge University who was very, very knowledgeable. Yeah. That really helped. I've got great tutors at the uni and you've been very, very knowledgeable. So if you have the right teachers, mm. and that's what this is about, isn't it? If yes. you have systematic evidence-based learning, yeah. it's going to help. Mm. But Robert, you're not getting this at your university. No, unfortunately not. I mean, we had a subject, which it could have changed now, a third year subject called inclusive education. Um, and, and that was where dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, dysgraphia, uh, talking about ASD and ADHD, those terms were brought up, yep. right? And and I remember very briefly an assessment that we had to explore one of those greatly. Now, unless I chose dyslexia, which I didn't, mm. how am I to know what it is? Mm. Then I get a job working at a school supporting these kids and I don't know what it is that I'm actually dealing with until stumbling across courses like the one that we've just completed with Bill. And, and now that that knowledge has grown, you think to yourself, well, the possibilities are endless. Now, just touching on what you said, Lara, it is a lot of hard work. We've got 
this program, Bill's program, embedded into our school on a daily routine, all the classes from reception to year six are doing some form of phonological awareness. Mm. And I'm learning on the go. I'm watching the kids while I was on placement at this school. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, they've got more meta language knowledge than what I do. And I'm supposed to be a teacher in a year and a bit. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. that that's that that sort of a, that shock to the system when you think, oh, I'm... Am I over over my sort of depth here? Am I am I out of my depth, not knowing all this stuff? And I mean, knowledge is power. So with the likes of yourself and Bill bringing light to this topic, that's how change starts. Um, it's worth mentioning you are at one of the South Australia's highest performing Catholic education schools in this area, right? Um, yes, yes. So there's no surprise that you watch what those kids do. So the school you're at's been at this for a few years. Yes. Yeah, and the the, the wave one, wave two, and wave two, three teaching is exemplary. Yeah. So don't feel too bad about that. What am I seeing, and why don't I know this stuff? Yeah. Because yeah, it's you're in a high performing school. Yeah. Mate. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And and that's you know at times you forget that you know because. Yeah. We just walk in. I mean, I walk in every day. It's just mm. another day at work. Yeah. The kids will, you know, side off everything that they know. And I think to myself, wow, their knowledge is so impressive. But I didn't see the beginning of it when things like that weren't put in place and, and how those kids were performing. Yeah. I mean, I heard the other day with NAPLAN having just been concluded that our results are continuing to, you know, progress yeah. in terms of literacy. And it's because of trainings as such. So, no, hats off to yourself, Bill, and, and Michael oh, mate, for, I'm just for doing things like this. I'm on the chain of a long list of people fighting this battle, but thank you. So, if you'll indulge me, Michael, Please. and if you guys will indulge me, I want to read something Greg Ashman said, uh, because we've what we're having, without naming it, is a conversation about explicit structured teaching. So, in, in, in the Filling the Pale blog, Greg has said, just as some dogs have three legs, some people working in teacher education are excellent. However, the vast majority of courses appear to convey a disdain for explicit teaching and effective classroom management, coupled with a focus on inquiry learning, differentiation, voguish social justice causes and other abstract stuff, none of which is supposed... Uh, so, sorry, none of which is supported by a strong body of evidence showing it is likely to improve educational outcomes. And if we raise this point, we are as likely as not to obtain the response that drawing on evidence is not appropriate for a project as complex and as beautiful as education. There's even a pejorative name. So pejorative is not nice, is it? No. There is a pejorative name um, <laughs> for valuing scientific evidence, evidence positivism, which seems to be based upon the misconception that scientific evidence is, is certain and deterministic rather than probabilistic. So basically he has said, and he said what another guy called Mark Seidenberg, an American academic, said, Mark Seidenberg is scathing of education or teacher education because he says it's heavily ideological. Mm -hmm. um, his words kind of go like uh, educate, teacher education to keeps science at an arm's length. So whereas you would not get away with this stuff if you were training to be a doctor, you would not get away with this stuff if you were training to be an engineer because everything in certain professions is based on an evidence base. When we're talking about educating young minds, we have to be really careful with what we do hmm. and um, we need to use evidence-based theories and practices. So um, we need to be incredibly careful with what we do with children and if we're not using evidence-based practices, what are we using? Mm. We can't just pull things out of a hat when looking at curriculum and practices. It must be evidence-based. Just deciding to do something because you like it and think it's fun isn't good enough when it comes to educating children. Mm. Full mm. stop. Yeah. Mm. I agree. Yeah. So when you're in your course, are you taught ab about how to recognise good evidence? Because... I see a lot of examples, and I've had these examples personally, where schools or even education departments call some practices evidence-based. And it doesn't take long scratching beneath the surface to see that the evidence is actually evidence collected by the people who sell the course themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you click two or three layers deep, you see it was them that conducted the educational studies with seven students and lo and behold, they all achieved amazing <laughs> results. Uh, N equals seven, mate. That's, yeah. a, that's really good <laughs> research. No. And so I actually think it's quite difficult to know when something is evidence-based 
Is it? Or do you get taught that? Do you do they talk to you in your course about how to work out whether something is evidence based or not? That's actually a really good question. I think that might take time for you to be able to realise that for yourself. Admittedly, I think as a school leaver, you would find that very difficult to ascertain for yourself. I think being someone a little older like myself and having lived in the world for a little while and studied quite a few things already, you can determine that a little differently. But I think possibly being 18 or 19, I don't know if you might have a different theory on this one, Rob. No, no. Um, I think you just take it as you receive it from a lecturer. If a lecturer tells you this is evidence-based and it's from Shayowitz, for example, mm. um, this has been through Yale University and blah, 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 and it was conducted at this time at this stage and they're a neurologist and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. You would just take that on face value. Mm. Whereas if you've uh, read the studies and you've seen that it was peer-reviewed, for example, peer-reviewed is a catchphrase at the moment. If something's peer-reviewed, it's evidence-based or it's, mm. it's, it's deemed appropriate for evidence-based studies, for example. But I don't know if you can really know if it's evidence-based unless it's been conducted in a certain way. But no, I don't recall actually have, having been told that, but I might be mm. shot by my <laughs> lecturer and, and the dean. If yeah. <laughs> I might have been told, but I don't actually be, recall being told exactly that. Well, I could back you up. Uh, mm. Not until I did a master's in education uh, and did a course called Research Methods and Applications mm. could I look at two bits of research and go, well, that's garbage mm. because it's got mm. small sample size, it's not been replicated and it's not peer-reviewed mm. compared to something that someone told me is, air commas, evidence-based. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, well, I think that's what I was trying to say. Thank mm. you for that's all right. yeah. making it sound better. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Yeah, what well, about you, Robert? Just touching on that knowledge of evidence-based versus not evidence-based I don't really have much of it. I mean, if I was completing an assessment, this is where my mind's going with this question. If I was completing an assessment and my lecturer says, oh, you should put this reference in there and look at the data and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to take that for face value. So would I. Mm. And not look any deeper. Mm. Because yeah. number one, I want the grade. Number two, the the, the information seems legit. <laughs> what, mm. what more digging am I going to do to to understand what that terminology is? So, no, that's something else that, you know, if we're thinking about moving forward and growth and change and refinement of, of practice, something that could be brought in a lot earlier. Mm. That way we're not having to go do you know what evidence base means and all that kind of stuff? So, yeah. How much focus do you do in your current teacher training on subject matter versus teaching? Because I know now it's a long time since I did my teacher training, but I did three subjects. So I did physical education, which was very much focused on how do you teach. So very much talking about explicit instruction, giving yep. you step-by-step -step guide. This is how you actually teach a skill. And that hasn't changed yet yeah. for PE. For anyway. PE, it right. hasn't changed. Yeah. And, no. it, and it was less about you becoming a great tennis player or you becoming a great cricketer. You know, you did all the sports, but mm -hmm. you did them to learn to teach them. Exactly mm. right, yes. Whereas when I did science and drama at uni teaching, there was virtually no talk of how do you teach it, Yeah, it was just like I was doing a university science degree. You know, I yeah. would just do biology one, biology two, have an exam, write an essay. There was virtually no talk of teaching. So where is that mix at the moment in your courses? Well, my first uni attempt was probably around the same time as you. Michael. Oh, you're so kind. Yeah. <laughs> and we're only in our 20s, right? No. So um, – that was my first go and then I joined the police. So in my second round, I'm not actually up to practicals yet. Right. So I can't really give you much advice there on what we're doing because I haven't actually started that yet. But at the moment with all of the theoretical side of things, it's it's uh, talking about gaining experience with the explicit side of teaching. So I'll hand over to Rob on that. So um, I can't give you too much information there, but we're edging into talking about being very hands-on, but yeah, I'll hand over. Mm. Yeah, so um, my experience, similar to that of what you described for, for PE, right? So I'm also minoring in PE um, and Catholic studies. So PE, very much practical-based. This is the task or the, or the objective, if you want to call it that. This is the age group that we're teaching, and this is how we would teach it, right? 
talking about growth and motor development, where a kid's going to be at, at the cognitive stage of learning, all that kind of stuff, mm. right? Versus your literacy, your mathematics, your HASS, sciences, etc. that it's more, here's the content you need to teach at these year levels. Here's an assessment where you need to write a report about how you're going to conduct those things on placement. So now that becomes branched off into our professional experience and there's the opportunity for us to explore the actual practice of it. Mm. And then a part of that assessment is to evaluate, well, how did it go? Yeah. Right? So, But are you taught how it? So when you do your placement, are you kind of thrown in the deep end? Yeah, or are you bit. taught, hey, this is actually how you do it? I mean, the way the university structures it, and this is, you know, no offense to them, mm. You go in for a few leading days, you get a vibe of the class, you're observing your teacher and what they're doing for those different subjects. The more you see, the more prepared you're going to be, right? So then you are sort of thrown in if you don't do your best note-taking or observations, etc. on those leading days to go, well, I'm here day one. Here's that assessment criteria that I need to fulfill. I've also got maybe 40 hours here of, of placement that I need to do. Yeah. Let's try it out. But to the uni's respect from the first year we were in for placement from the get-go yeah. versus that of like you know adelaide university i have a friend who goes there that they didn't experience placement that early on i think she said and don't quote me on this it was maybe their second or third year so they were m very much taught here's the theory behind what we're teaching and how to teach it versus here's the actual practicality of it and, mm. and here's a taste of it mm. you know so that way you are seeing that drop out of of people experiencing in their first year and going this isn't for me mm. rather than carrying on with this degree and then getting to the end and going well i'm not equipped for this because mm. of these experiences and i don't like children exactly <laughs> oh man that's the last thing you want so i remember my teacher training and um so we went out, I was UniSA, and yes, they got us out early, right? So we could work out whether children were something that, you know, we'd like to hang around for the rest of our work life. <laughs> uh, um, and what occurred to me was some of us were very lucky with the teachers we were placed with, and some of us weren't so lucky, and our experience really heavily depended on our placement. And some of us landed in teachers who, in teachers' classrooms who were just exemplary. Uh, were teaching really, really well, uh, engaged, just tried to get us in, and others were sat in the back. Um, and it was a very different experience. And I remember thinking, wow, this is potluck. Uh, in a teaching degree, and I did a primary teaching degree, and I specialised in PE like you are, Robert, and like you did, Michael, I was thinking, man, this degree takes on a very, very different shade depending on that experience of mm. where you land and placement. Yeah. Yeah, well, I see a lot of talk out there saying that um, an apprenticeship approach to teacher education would be better than a university approach. What do you think of that? Because, like, I don't, I don't know the answer personally. My feeling is, however, an apprenticeship approach would be quite useful. Yeah. I, I personally think there's too much emphasis on gaining knowledge without the teaching skills. And yeah. I know you can do, like, a three-year degree and then just add on one year of teaching and now you're out in a school teaching. Yeah. And having been a teacher, finding out the knowledge is not the hard part. The hard part's the teaching part. Of course. It, it doesn't always come down to, like you said, the knowledge. Yes, we need to be knowledgeable people. At the end of the day, we, we've got children that are, that are, in some cases, idolizing the things that we're saying and doing and the way we carry ourselves as people, right? If you don't have the knowledge behind who you are, the personality to be able to connect with another human, right? It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So you're going to stumble across those people that are practicing teachers, etc. that, you know, sort of like robots, the most knowledgeable people you ever come across but the delivery of which they mm. can give children that information is not accessible. The relational mm. special source. Yeah. Exactly mm. right. Mm. So for the apprenticeship comment, if we, you know, teaching and education, right, it, it's the pinnacle of us evolving as humans, right? How, how do you make that more accessible mm. for people to want to take on a role as such to then make our human race better? better mm. that, yeah. that's how i sort of think about it a bit i've got another theory and i think what you're doing rob is an exemplary idea and that is being an eso before becoming a teacher or doing it at the same time as your uni degree 
There are so many, and I, I don't want to sound negative, there are a lot of um, school leavers at university at the moment, and I'm sorry to those who are listening that I'm at uni with, there are a lot of school leavers there who are either A, in a teaching degree because they didn't get into what they wanted to be in, mm. mm-hmm. or they're in it because um, their parents told them to be in it, or they they don't want to be there and they're just there because they have to be there. Yep. And they don't know what teaching's about. They've purely slid into teaching because they feel comfortable in the classroom and that's their next step. Mm. And I feel that if they had a chance to be in a classroom, get a feel for what it's like to be there, get a feel for what it's like to be with children or students and see what it's like to engage, interact, be part of that movement instead of being at uni for those four years, doing the observation practical, doing the teaching practical, which isn't like being there day in, day out for six hours. Yeah. It's a completely different ball game. Mm. I mean, I spent every um, school uh, holiday that I wasn't at school and every afternoon with my mum for nearly 15, 20 years and then I was a teacher as an adult teacher. So I, I kind of know what it's mm. about. I don't know everything but I kind of know I've, mm. I've avoided being a teacher for 26, 27 years and now I'm doing it. You, you kind of know what you're in for yeah. Yeah. whereas so many of them think they know and then they get out there and they do it for five years and then they leave and all of that money and time is wasted mm-hmm. So your idea of the apprenticeship or other people's idea of the apprenticeship, yeah, that's kind of an idea. But what about making it um, a bit of an idea where you roll into it with the ESO movement of, Mm. you know, gradually training while you're training? And, you know, how have you found that doing the ESO work while you're um, doing a university training to prepare you? Definitely helps because you now, you're acting almost as a teacher, right? You're there all day, just like the teachers are. You're there Monday to Friday. Not all of us are. That's fine. And you are experiencing the challenges, mm. the different complexities of every class, every mm. year level, and it hits you and you go, and, and I have my moments still that I go, is this really what I'm signing up for? Mm. Or even better, you can flip it and go, this is what I would change, right? So you're already reflecting on practice that isn't even yours, trying to prepare yourself for when you get out. Now, not everybody's going to do that. I work with some brilliant ESOs that they don't have a, a you know bachelor degree behind them, but they are so knowledgeable for having done courses as such. We train so many here. Yeah. Exactly right. So, and But they're the type of people that we need that want to go and seek more to benefit their role, mm-hmm. not just roll in because, oh, why not, or, or take on the degree because, and I hate this, you guys get really good holidays. Hey, if, if these people knew what teachers are getting up to in yeah. their holidays, they wouldn't be discussing it yeah. like it's a it's an easy ticket to make some money. It's really not the case. I yeah. think teachers are very much underpaid. Like for the amount that you're doing, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And, and and the we think about doctors and engineers and 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 all the um the precautions around their work. Oh, they're dealing with lives. They're dealing with structured buildings, etc. We're dealing with young minds every yes. day, right? So where's where's that pressure and that recognition yeah. mm. for what we're doing? Mm. It's so it's lost in You're there You're making somewhere. or breaking the next generation. Well, you are. So many people think it's just babysitting children day in day out, but it's just so much more than that. It's and doing the bare necessity. Mm. Yeah, That's it's the other it's thing. not. Yeah. I watched my mum for so many years putting so much effort in, and she she watched all of the cycles of of teaching literacy and language mm. from the mid-60s all the way through till 2017 when she um, uh, retired and she the whole way through refused to stop teaching phonics. Structured she just refused. Phonics. She kept doing the explicit teaching. She kept doing the evidence-based approaches because she knew it worked. Lara, people mm. got kicked out of schools. People got told they can't teach anymore because they did what you're I know, did. yeah, yeah. yeah. But mm. because she taught the um, children with behavioural issues, they kept her. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> That's another story. You can do. <laughs> but, okay, so this is interesting. I want to pick up on a thread here that both of – you mentioned – so we're talking about the professionalism of this role. So, Michael, you started with this question, should this be seen more as a trade or a training or an apprenticeship? Yeah. Um, not so university-oriented. Um, Robert, you then talked about – you use an example of engineers or doctors and mm. needing a very specialised set of skills and those skills are evidence-based. So an engineer, to go build a bridge, has to do it a certain way. 
Of course. Right? Loads have to be right. Yep. All sorts of stuff. A doctor needs to know a difference between A and B blood group. Yep. Um, I was talking to someone, I've spoken to lots of people in pre-service teacher education who um, couldn't tell me what a noun or a verb is. Wow. Discuss. Hmm. What does this say um, about... Yeah. Well, I told you today in the course, sorry if I butted in no, on no, you, I told you today in the course, and I'm sorry to mention it, that um, there are a lot of people at university who don't know the difference between a noun or a verb. What is that? What's causing that? Is it the training? Is it the people? Is it a combination of both? I don't know. Well, I, I blame technology. Um, I think because we've moved from handwritten work, which is what I was used to at high school and even university my first time around, we've gone to computers where you don't have to remember certain things. You don't mm. even remember, you don't need to remember how to spell. No. You type it in and the or computer tells you dictation. what to do. Yep, dictation. grammar even. Yep. You get something wrong, it underlines it and says, did you mean whatever? Did you mean mm. to put a comma here? Did you mean this? The Thesaurus comes up. You know, I, I just think that um, we don't need to remember certain things anymore. You even write an essay, it'll give you suggestions. Okay. So I wonder whether from year 10 to 12, you're so busy remembering all the content from your courses in high school that your grammar and spelling dictation, like you said, you, you just smudge over those things and you don't need to remember those things anymore. So you come to university, mm. you, go, you draw a blank with that sort of thing. So yeah. in one of our workshops, we had to go over all of that again. Mm. Yep. to continue with the rest of the things from that workshop. Because you're going to be teaching that to young people? I mean, what's the reason you go back in? Because you're, what you're talking about is these skills become automated. Now, mm. I, I can be a good Correct. writer. I know how to put together a really good sentence and I don't necessarily have to be able to define a noun and a verb. Mm. But it's different when all of a sudden you're with young writers, early writers and mm. early readers, and we need a meta language. We need a language to talk about language. So we can mm -hmm. teach kids to put together a good sentence. Correct. Of yeah. course. You're always going to have that one kid or multiple kids who are going to ask that question of, but what does that mean? Yeah. And what happens when the teacher is not prepared for that? Mm. Mm. Well, you You're say, I don't head. know. But yeah. I'll look it up. Let's yeah, work yeah, it out yeah. together. Deflect it. Right? Yeah, to be <laughs> honest, and you, you I think it device. takes a lot of integrity, mm. to be honest. And I think, to, like we said today, and you said it too, Michael, it's better to be honest and show integrity and say, I don't know, mm. and to look it up because that shows that we're, we can be fault. Uh, makers too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't want to create that rod for your back where you've got to know the answer to everything because you can't. We're not robots. You can't know the answer to everything. So we need a highly sophisticated understanding of um, our spelling system to teach it well. Uh, we, I, I'm pretty sure we can agree on that. And you guys yeah. have had three days of really dipping your toe into the sophistication. You, you already knew English was tough, right? You know, it's tough yeah, orthography. Yeah. Um, so how well are teacher training institutions, how well are they cutting the mustard when it comes to equipping pre-service teachers with that highly sophisticated knowledge of our reading, uh, sorry, our spelling system, and how to teach it? Actually, how to teach and what to teach. If I was answering that question without having gone to high school and had success with literacy, I'd say that they're not cutting it, right? But my prior knowledge before getting to uni was enough for me to get through uni to go, all right, I'm, I'm confident to you get You didn't have to teach placement. it to anyone at uni though, Robert, did you? No, I didn't. No. Not until I got out on placement, yeah. right? So, But once again, thrown in the deep end, not necessarily shown how to teach it, mm. just sort of go off of what your mentor teacher's doing. They gave you the topic earlier on, first, second year. Here's the, you know, here's the work or that the activity that you're going to be covering. Let's see how you go with executing that and what the kids do with, with that, you know. So to answer your question, wouldn't be equipped mm. from the perspective of knowing how exactly to teach it. I mean, you know, you touch on theories of teaching and, and, and all those different psychological principles that children are going to undergo when they're learning something new, right? So, long story short, no, Bill. You guys haven't made this criticism, but it has been made in a number of different spots around teacher education that there's a lot of – a big part of teacher training programs are discussing and debating and looking at different ways, uh, different – constructions of how we should teach different different 
points of view on how kids learn and what we should be doing. But a lot of young, a lot of pre-service teachers I talk to say, at no point has anyone said, this is what you should be teaching and this is how you should be teaching it. This is what the evidence tells us. People are still telling me that they come out and they're left with this. They've got this kind of really eclectic, broad analysis of issues. Yeah. Yeah. In their teacher training. Yeah. But no one said, look, do it this way because right now this is what the evidence says. Nobody's saying that. I've been given that pretty clear instruction that this is what the evidence says, this is what you should be doing and this is these are the activities and we suggest you do it this way. Fabulous. Um, the course that I'm doing is a f- – First year course. So you're getting this in first year? Getting it in first year. Oh, wow. There are a bunch of people that are doing it in their second year because it's being done retrospectively because it's a new course. Okay. A lot of it is actually a speech pathology based uh, component mm-hmm. because a lot of it is um, to do with uh, speech path issues. Uh, we're doing speech uh, disorders and, and language based disorders as part of it so we and can understand how uh, graphemes and more. Uh, Phonemes work yes. with the mouth and such. Um, but uh, granted, we haven't learnt a lot of the um, teaching, um, planning and uh, delivery because it's first year, yeah. obviously. Mm-hmm. But we've learnt about uh, a lot of the um, uh, activities that one can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we haven't gone into detail clearly because it's first year. Yeah. Mm. So Shit. it's very yeah. obvious what needs to be done and yeah. activities that one can do. Mm. It's very clear. It's it's outlined in the lesson in the uh, lectures and, and I had the workshops. A, I had a look through that course and shout out to Flinders. Please never stop doing this. Do more of it. Yeah. Mm. Because there will be lots of teachers and pre-service teachers listening, going, "I haven't had a skerrick of that." I There's a lot of really work. There's a lot of content. A lot of reading. Yep. Um, and um, it's. It makes you sleep at night because there's a lot of work, um, mm. but uh, it's been really interesting. And w- doing your course on top of it has cemented everything. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And what about you, Robert? I mean, no discredit to UniSA, but my question, like, would be why why haven't they taken this approach yet? Mm. Like, what why is it that just Flinders is now introducing this? Is is there some secret relationship between Bill and Flinders? No, nope. no. <laughs> See what I mean, right? Mm. So why if we're if we as pre service teachers, practicing teachers, educators like like Bill who aren't classified as classroom teachers mm. anymore, mm. right? What are we all sharing? This idea of refining our our skill set, right? So. Our tutors, lecturers, etc., are they not refining their skill set to be able to say, well, this needs to change? Mm. <laughs> That's my question. Yeah, well, the, what, what I wonder is, I mean, that sounds brilliant, what you're doing and mm. the fact that the course has changed. You know, I can't comment from personal experience because I didn't do primary teaching. Um, but it sounds like this is the start of something new. You know, what I wonder is... Why hasn't this been happening for twenty years? Yeah, I mean that's kind of a pointless thing to wonder, and I, you know, I think we kind of know the answer because it is a complicated thing, and there have been these beliefs and agendas, and there's been this, you know, the reading wars. But it sounds to me like, especially in your case, you know, the science of reading and, you know, uh, structured literacy approach is starting to make its way into teacher education, which. You know, is brilliant news. Well, it is where Lara goes. Mm. Um, well, it's nothing new, really. It's just being reintroduced. Yeah, that's right. Light. That's right. The old that's brought right. back again, but uh, not in Robert's case. And I wonder if that's part of the issue is this lack of consistency, mm. or are they just yet to catch on to that wave? Mm. Well, right? I mean, these are universities. These these are the places that research comes out of, and um, the efficacy of structured literacy is not new. <laughs> No, <laughs> you know. True, true. So what's what's holding it back? I, look, I've mentioned Seidenberg a couple of times. I want to go there. So Mark Seidenberg, uh, an American um, uh, neuroscientist, wrote a great book called Language at the Speed of Sight, and I'll quote him directly. 
He's talking about teacher pre-service, pre-service teacher education and he says the distortions in how science functions in education reflect what happened when an isolated inbred community of scholars and practitioners developed an arm's length stance towards research. The field then turns out practitioners who lack the tools to evaluate what they are taught about issues such as how children learn to read. Absent these tools, they're forced to rely on personal experience or the assurances of authorities whose reliability is difficult to assess or the treacherous internet, where some experts uh, teach claims made in the Cambridge reading hoax as true. I won't go into what the Cambridge reading hoax is, but you see, Seidenberg is brutal. Mm. Yeah. Uh, But I think it's actually, well, based on my experience and lots of people I've taught, uh, sorry, lots of people I've worked with, uh, current company accepted, that is the overall experience of their pre-service teacher training. I have a feeling that this is happening at Flinders because someone who's pretty influential has spoken to the right people and rubbed a few people the right way, uh, has convinced people that this should be part of the first year of a pre-service teacher education and uh, uh, course. And I think absolutely fantastic. No matter what way it comes about, great. This isn't happening everywhere though, is it? No. No. Well, last year I did a, a big assignment on dyslexia because my partner's son – um, has it mm. and I was quite upset that we didn't receive any training on early indicators at yeah, all yeah. and um, I said to someone you know do we do a course in this and we didn't and I'm really pleased that this year we do. And it's core everyone has to do what you're doing? If you're doing early childhood or primary you have to do it. Okay good. It's mm. a core Gee, subject. News, isn't it? Yeah. There's no way that no. I made this happen it no. just happened. Yeah mm. <laughs> yeah. Whereas yeah. you, Robert, have you've had to go on out and get it yourself. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Fortunately enough, I work, you know, at a school where yeah. where they're pushing for this this change and this yes. knowledge, and and to get as many of us through the training as possible. Mm. That way, we are changing these kids' lives yeah. and making reading and writing accessible for them. Mm. Because if they can't do that, well, we're setting them up for failure. Yes. Mm. Well, yeah. thank you, Lara. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Michael. Brilliant. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Excellent discussion. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and listening. We hope you've got something out of it. And please, if you listen to this and you've got something to say, hop on uh, the Discastia website and put something in the notes. We want to, we want to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's always great to hear comments and we're happy to answer questions. Yeah. Um, if you want to keep up to date, you can subscribe to Discastia at our website, discastia.com, and you'll find links there to Bill's social media profile, my profile. So feel free to reach out. We'd love to have a discussion. And thanks again for joining us, everyone. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thanks, guys. Take care. We'd love to extend an invitation to anyone from the teacher training universities to join us to see firsthand the power of highly structured language instruction at Salisbury Primary School in 2023, or to train with us in intensive multi-sensory intervention in our TSD suite of trainings. We're seeing firsthand what teachers with high level expertise in English orthography, structured, explicit, multi-sensory instruction and cognitive load theory can do in the most socially disadvantaged schools. This is truly social justice in action. Thanks again for listening and for more information visit discastia.com.